for your wonderful energy. Thank you for your good attention. I wish you a wonderful rest of your night. Wonderful rest of the week ahead. May there be peace. And may there be happiness in your heart always. And may your heart always be growing in compassion and kindness and gratitude and forgiveness and humility. And especially in loving. Just let that love pour out of your heart always. Like sunbeams toward everybody. Don't leave a single person out. And you can do this. You will serve the world around you and you will feel better than you've ever felt in your life. Namaste. Namaste. Lewis Rothline is a yoga teacher. More specifically, he's an Ashtanga yoga teacher. He's been teaching for over 20 years. And today on the podcast, he shares with us what Ashtanga yoga is specifically and what yoga means for him, how he found it, and what he enjoys about the practice. Those words you heard at the beginning are the words that Lewis shares at the end of every yoga class that he teaches. He ends every one of his classes with that charge. And that's how I came to know Lewis, because he's my yoga teacher. He introduced me to the discipline of Ashtanga, which has changed my life. And as many of you know who are listening to this, Yoga is much more than just a workout or an exercise program. It's a pathway to self-discovery. And so for the past three years, I've been going to Lewis's classes, and I've heard that closing charge a number of times, and every time it fills me with inspiration. So I was pretty nervous at having Lewis on the podcast because he's my yoga teacher and I knew very little about him before I asked him if he would be on. But I knew just enough to be intrigued about his personal background. And I'm excited because he shares that with us today. So this was very special for me personally getting a chance to sit down and talk with Lewis, and I hope you find our conversation interesting and useful. He takes the time to open up about his background, and he's lived a very interesting life. It was funny because the week before he was scheduled to sit down with me, we saw in the Asheville Citizen Times that he had designed a crossword puzzle for the New York Times. And my girlfriend Brooke approached him in class and said, Lewis, you contain multitudes. Which is well put, because as I came to find out, he does contain multitudes. And I really enjoyed talking with him. He's just as lovely in a one-on-one conversation as he is inspiring as a yoga teacher. So I hope you enjoy our conversation, and I hope you take something out of it. This is Lewis Rothline. I ask how you got where did this idea for this project come from it came from well you know I'm a psychiatrist and I have a private practice um, 
And so I'd been listening to a lot of podcasts, particularly the past uh, year and a half. And Mark Marin, I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's a comedian. He's been around a while. Um, but he got in pretty early with the podcast interviewing thing. And uh, he's done 600 episodes. He just came to Asheville, performed at the Orange Peel. So I just kind of got obsessed with his interviewing. And he does these long-form interviews. And I just loved them. You know, it's comedians, actors, directors, musicians, writers, you know, pop culture type stuff. But he's really funny. And so it's, you know, it's And so you're, you're focusing on people in the healing arts. Yeah. Because that's where I'm at. Um, but it's interesting about Marin is that uh, today he is scheduled to interview President Obama. Wow. Yeah. He just hit the mother load of interviewing candidates. So that's going to get him even more popularity. You know, he's sold out the orange peel already, so he's uh, pretty popular. But it's, it's also probably going to drive the format just a little bit more. It's a growing format. And, you know, after a while of listening to him, I was like, you know, this would be a good way to connect with my clients. You know, my practice is a little different. Um, yeah, again, the, the idea is health and healing. And eventually, you know, I figured that this would be a good way to connect with people who found my work because it's easy to get misinterpreted in the type of work I do that, you know, I'm saying meds are all bad or something like that. It's easy to boil things down and, you know, it's much more nuanced. And so this gives me an opportunity to just kind of slip in uh, elements of my practice in the, fo- in the context of natural conversations over time, as well as, you know, a lot of what I do is try to refer people to, and so, you know, like yoga is... So that's your general approach, is like meds is last, your last, you know, choice? Yeah, I mean, it's funny because I was trained pretty much with a heavy emphasis on med management. Uh, we did get a year of intensive psychotherapy training, but the primary emphasis for a number of reasons, I mean, the pharmaceutical companies have wriggled their way into residency trainings and even med schools. And psychiatry as a discipline has also kind of marginalized itself to med management, in part because of the insurance companies and the pressure and the nature of using psychiatrists in that role and so so for a while my practice was fairly orthodox in that uh, you know I would try to match people's symptoms up with a diagnosis yeah. and then match a diagnosis with a medication I mean I, I always considered myself a minimalist but yeah I mean it's it's a process and you know and the idea with the podcast is that over time I can have a body of work to refer people to, to say, hey, you know, check out yoga. And maybe it'll help to be able to hear someone's perspective on it. Can I ask how, just one more question? Sure, I, yeah. But how long have you been doing yoga? Three years. Yeah. And, yeah, it's changed my life. See, it's changed my practice even. I mean, I'd started into the world of medication tapering and withdrawal uh, about that time, but it's just enhanced my understanding of the gradual nature of change in the human body and the human mind and spirit and how that is uh, most likely to stick and how and, and also the value of acceptance of where we're at, which you speak of a lot, and you know is taught through yoga. So this is this is a it's it's changed my life. Yeah. Yoga is a great teacher. Yeah. So um, why don't we start picking things up with uh, with you? Okay. Yeah. And I like to take kind of a chronological approach. So, where are you from? Where are you born? I was born in Miami Beach. Hmm. <clears throat> um, and I lived in Miami Beach through seventh grade. Hmm. 
And this was, you know, before South Beach was anything. It was before the people from Cuba came in. Back then, it was, it was all Jewish. <clears throat> in fact, I went to public school, and so first, second, third grade, it wasn't until third grade in public school when the first non-Jewish person showed up in one of my classes. Hmm. So are you Jewish? I am. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Both parents? Yes. Okay. Yeah. But my wife is not, so. Okay. Yeah. So growing up in Miami Beach, heavy presence of the Jewish community mm -hmm. and almost exclusive is, is what you were saying. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that changed all of a sudden. Like fourth and fifth grade, suddenly there were just lots of Cuban people uh -huh. coming into our classrooms. Is and this the 60s we're talking about? Well, let's 70s? see. No, it's the 50s. 50s, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. I am very close to 67. Whoa, okay. I did not know that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you get that a lot because you do not look 67 by any means. Oh. I, I thought, I, I, I didn't know. I would have guessed you were in your, your 50s, your early 50s is what I was really, well, that's where nice. I pegged. That's nice. Cool. <laughs> wow. So that kind of reframes my imagination here. I'm going to have to <laughs> click it back a little bit. So in the 50s. Mm -hmm. was when things started changing in Cuba. Yes. Yeah. I went yeah. to Cuba in 2010 on vacation for a week. So I've learned a little bit about Cuban history. Uh, 1959 was the big, that's when the revolution happened, right? January 1st, 1959. Yeah, I would have been in fifth grade. Okay, right. Okay, that makes sense. That's when it really got heated then. And so people started fleeing Cuba. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, that changed your school, I guess. Yeah, it changed. Yeah, it changed. It changed the population uh, immensely. Okay. Yeah. What was it like? And it wasn't bad. Uh, it, it was just. It was just. You know. It was a change. It was different. It was interesting. I remember I was running for president of my middle school, the junior high school. We called it then, and. A lot of the posters that were up for people that were running were in Spanish. Uh huh. You know, so there was it was it was just different. Uh huh. But I, it wasn't bad, and and, and there was never any n nobody ever had anything bad to say about it. Actually. Yeah, it was a smooth process. Mm hmm. Uh huh. That's good. Do you speak Spanish? Mm hmm. No. Okay. No. So then part of your school is developing this Spanish-speaking presence, Cuban-American presence. Yes, but in ninth grade, we moved out of Miami Beach. We moved to North Miami Beach, and it was a totally different. I was one of the only Jewish people in class okay. in, in, in this area. And again, not, nothing, it was not a big deal. It actually made me sort of special. I was like, different and so that was cool mm -hmm. when I was in elementary school was when a lot of the most the biggest and most famous Miami Beach hotels were being built uh -huh. the Fountain Blue and the Eden Rock and the Deauville and the Carillon and in seventh grade all my friends were getting bar mitzvah and all my friends were really rich and we were not but they would always have their receptions in one of these big hotels with ice sculptures and, and tables filled with food. So that was, a, that was a fun year, every weekend going to a different celebration. Uh-huh. You got to experience that, that part of the culture. Huh? So how many were in your family? Well, I've got two sisters and a brother. Okay. Uh, an older sister, then me, and then my brother, and then my youngest sister. Okay. Okay, so the four of you and your parents, what, what, was, what was it like growing up, the, the six of y'all? Well, I had a, a pretty rotten childhood, actually. Um, 
I was beaten a lot and I was verbally abused. So my childhood was not terribly happy. Mm. Was this in the house or bullies or? It was in the house. Yeah. Yeah. Father. Uh, well, father and mother. You know, my mm -hmm. mother was always she was the, she would well she would sometimes you know beat me with a hairbrush and uh, she was the one more than my dad who verbally abused. You know, you're never going to amount to anything. You're good for nothing. Blah blah blah. My father was was the muscle who would g give me hard beatings, mm. you know. And it was always me. It wasn't my older sister. She uh, she was like their angel. So, mm. you know, it was not a terribly happy childhood. Right. So the the situ you know the location didn't matter that much, you know. It it uh, I was not in a happy frame of mind. Yeah. Wow. And so that was a lot to deal with, and that was uh, all the way through school. Actually, um, yeah. Uh, I was really mixed up in high school, and yet, you know, can we talk about high school? Or, or? yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we'll just go with the flow. Um. Because I remember in high school, I had a real spiritual experience. And I don't think, I don't know if it would have happened if I wasn't really mixed up. I mean, I was mixed up because I was trying to figure out who I was. Um, this was a big thing with me in high school. You know, are the things coming out of my mouth, is, it, is that me? Uh, you know, or is that just trying me trying to make people happy do you know and i was i i would do experiments i would just like clam up like not say anything to anybody unless it just absolutely popped out of my mouth then i knew that came from me and i actually you know did that for a long time i did that for it started in high school and it went through a few years of college but when I came to the end of that, I had a much better sense of who I was. I really felt like, oh, this is me and this is me talking. And that was a big deal because I was thrown totally off kilter, I guess, by my parents mm -hmm. earlier, earlier right. on. But anyway, do you want to hear about the spiritual experience? Well, of course, yeah. Um, yeah. My father uh, was a general contractor, and, he, and we were in... In high school, we were in Satellite Beach, Florida, which is the Space Coast. Yeah. And he had a job on Cape Kennedy. Back then, it was Cape Canaveral. Um, I was doing payroll. Basically, I think they were just trying to put me somewhere so I wouldn't get in trouble. Mm -hmm. And so I had, I'm had i sitting in this trailer, you know, it was kind of cool because whenever a rocket would fire off, I had like the most incredible view. But I'd be sitting in this trailer all day long and my work that I had to do, marking down payroll, took less than a half hour. So I had a lot of time to think. Hmm. And I remember one day I was sitting at the desk there and there was a window that was high up on the wall and you could look out and you could see the sky and it was the sky that happened to be above the ocean. Yeah. And I was staring out this window and I just told myself if I stared really hard, I could see what was behind the sky. This is how I was thinking. And <clears throat> so I did. I, and if I was not in this kind of frame of mind that comes from being a little crazy, I don't think I could have done this. But I just stared really hard out the window, and I don't know for how long. But all of a sudden, and, and, and this is real, I actually saw the sky through this window. I saw the sky kind of open up like a, like, 
for the two sides and the top and the bottom, just this this thing opened up a little rectangular hole in the sky. Yeah. And I could I actually saw like the, the these little curtain like opening. Yeah. And this this ray of energy came through this hole and it came through the window and it just totally surrounded me. And I just sat in the middle of it and I felt like I, I felt totally frightened and I felt totally ecstatic at the same time. And I don't even know how long that lasted. And then, I've, then I felt it withdraw, go back through the window, back through the sky. And, and with my own eyes, I saw these flaps close up on the sky and the sky became normal again. Were you doing anything to kind of bring it on, or did it, did it just happen to you, like like target you? You know, you know what I mean. Oh, were you did, meditating, or were you, you know? I was not meditating. Uh-huh. No. I was just uh, doing an experiment, uh-huh. and I don't know what why I thought of that. Mm. I don't know. Maybe I was thinking, you know, well, here's this world that we all see. It's it's almost like a movie screen that maybe can be opened up. I don't know. Maybe I was thinking like that. Yeah. And then I wanted to see if it was true. Uh huh. So I said, I'm going to stare. I'm going to see if I can see the other what's on the other side. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the most memorable moments of my whole life. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. And from that point on, I I became much more creative, um, just much more sort of aware and aware that there's more out there Mm -hmm. than just appearances. Yeah, Uh, that was uh, I'll never forget that. And it was just incredibly influential that that silly little experience. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm sure it didn't feel silly. No. And it doesn't sound silly. No. It sounds like a mystical experience, as some people call it. Yeah. Something that transcends words. And and I've never, nothing, I've had like sort of little spiritual experiences since then, but nothing like that one. Huh. I, I, I'm hoping it happens again. <laughs> yeah, <sometime>. right. <laughs> but uh, Wow. But How old were you? I was in 11th grade. Okay. So maybe 16, 17. Uh-huh. And was the abuse still going on at home or had you kind of escaped into high no, school? In high school my parents divorced. Okay. So that was another layer on top of everything else. Yeah. And and I was living with my mom, all the kids were with my mom. And she was just having enough to deal with one with the divorce and two trying to raise us and three trying to get her life in order you know uh, trying to meet new people and such that they weren't too much of a an influence then you were doing your own thing Mm -hmm. yeah have you talked about it before in certain circumstances or not Probably to a couple of people, but not very much. Yeah, I don't mind talking about it. It was something that happened. Well, it's it's really awesome to hear it. Um, it's funny, you know. This is like I was saying. This is the eighth one of these that I've done, and this is I've heard this from a number of folks. Huh. I've heard more about this in this context than in the work that I do as a psychiatrist, and I don't exactly know why that is, but. Um, it's it's intriguing and very interesting to me, and I'm sure it was for you. Did it change things for you? I started writing poetry. Uh huh. Yeah, that's what you're saying. I started. I got sort of even more introspective, trying to analyze my own life and and what I needed to do to start becoming happy. Uh huh. Um, and I, I would just seemed like I was just more aware of myself. And over the five, six, seven years 
after that, I just gradually worked my way through whatever I had to work through and became relatively sane <laughs> after that. So. Wow. Well, that's, uh, that's impressive to become sane as a late teenager, early 20s. <laughs> well, relatively, I said. Yeah, right. But you, 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 were able, you were able to find a sense of groundedness in life? and More so. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. I was. Did you graduate high school? I did. Yeah, okay. And then I went to the University of Florida in oh, okay. Gainesville. So I headed up state a little bit. Yeah. But <clears throat> my dad was making me feel guilty about taking money for college. Um, so after two years in college, I went into the army. Okay. <laughs> so I could, I could support myself. This was during the Vietnam War. Wow. But I didn't go to Vietnam. I kind of lucked out. I um, enlisted to play in the army band. Uh -huh. And they took me. And when they took me in, they said, do you want, do you want to pick the band you want to go to? Or do you want to just, you want us to pick for you? And I didn't care. I said, you pick for me. And it, what it turned out is that most people picked a band in the United States that was close to home. But then after they were in that band for a year, they got shipped over to Vietnam. Me, they sent to Germany. Hmm. And that's where I was for my full term of service. So I never went to Vietnam. And I'm grateful for that. Yeah. Because truly, if, if I had orders to go to Vietnam, I might have gone to Canada instead. Wow. Okay. So this is late 60s, and you joined the Army, and you're in the band. Did you play in the band? I did. Yeah? What yeah. was your instrument? Well, mainly it was saxophone. Yeah. I played some bass guitar, mm -hmm. and um, in the marching band, I ended up playing cymbals. Mm -hmm. I, just, I just showed up one day, because I, I didn't want to have to like read music while I was marching. I wanted to see everything that was going on, so I, instead of... <laughs> Showing up with a saxophone one day, I just showed up with cymbals, and nobody said anything. For the rest of my time, I played cymbals. <laughs> just an extra cymbals guy. Yeah, <laughs> right. which was cool. Well, it's better than holding a gun. <laughs> Ain't that uh, the truth? Yeah, yeah. And this was so real in the late 60s. Yeah, yeah I was Vietnam. in the service from 68 to 71. Okay. And wow. then I went back to college. Yeah. Was it terrifying? Being in the service? Yeah. Was it like always hope, wondering if your number was going to come up or? <clears throat> Not really. I mean, it. Um, it's, you know, it's, it, it didn't, nobody in, in the band, once I got to Germany, nobody got transferred to Vietnam. Okay. So it seemed like that's where I was going to be. But, you know, being in a place that you really can't get away from unless you're on leave where you're, you know, totally beholden to your superiors was not my style. Yeah. Um, but being with a bunch of musicians, we all just dealt with it pretty well. Yeah. Okay. And there was a lot of drug use, too. Yeah. And I, I partook in drugs some, but not to the extent that a lot of the guys did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's that's the culture, I guess. The late '60s and early '70s, you know, it's explosions all over the world. But you know, where I was coming from was I was, you know, finally kind of in touch with myself, mm -hmm. and I didn't want to lose this hold that I got of who I am um, by taking drugs, which kind of got me a little out of touch with myself yeah so and i didn't want to like life better with drugs than you know like feel better with drugs than just natural 
Yeah. So I didn't do drugs as much as a lot of the other people. Yeah. So thinking of the time, uh, you're, you're playing in a band. What kind of music were you into? Well, back then? Yeah. Oh, gosh. Well, you know, the Beatles and the Stones. Yeah. And we listened to a lot of classical music uh-huh. um, in the Army band. There were a lot of, you know, pretty darn good musicians. Too. Yeah, right. Um, and we listened to a lot of jazz. But, yeah. you know, I was a, a rock and roll kind of guy, too. Yeah. Well, that was, I mean, that was the good stuff. You know, I mean, that's the stuff that really seemed to drive a lot of the forces of change, at least looking back on it from somebody who didn't live through it. You know, that's the stuff that endured. Yeah, and it it kind of echoed a lot of the the energy of, you know, you have lots of energy when you're in your teens and early 20s. And, and it echoed just a lot of the anguish that I had inside. You yeah. Know, um, so it, it spoke to me a lot. Yeah. And I, I figured you were a Bob Dylan fan because I hear you playing Bob Dylan in yoga class, huh? Yeah, but not so much then. I mean, okay. I liked, you know, his big hits. And I remember yeah. when he started, you know, playing with electronic instruments, and that was a big deal. The purists, like, oh, he sold out. Yeah. But, you know, Lay Lady Lay, these big hits you know, Tambourine Man, sure, I was, but only in the last eight, ten years have I really started listening to all of his early stuff and absolutely falling in love with his talent and his uh, brilliance. Yeah, that's how Dylan's been for me. I, I, I go through periods where I get heavily into it and just start exploring all these albums that I never got around to, and then I'll put it down for five, ten years, <laughs> and then come back to a heavy exploration. I've actually got two 100% Dylan playlists for yoga classes. Okay. One, one is all covers, huh. uh, and one of is, is all him, you know? Uh-huh. And usually on the week of his birthday, I'll, let, I'll play one of them at least uh-huh. um, during my classes. Yeah. Okay, so... So you're in your 20s, and you make it through the Army without having to go to Vietnam, and then you did your four years, and then... uh, Three years. Three years, okay. Three years and change. Three years and change. And then you're back, you go back to Florida? Yeah, okay. And now I'm on the GI Bill, so I don't have to ask my dad for any money. Yeah, okay. um, So something good came of it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, that helped you through college? It paid for college, GI Bill for the most part. Okay. Yeah. What did you study there? I studied broadcast journalism. Oh, okay. All right. So this is familiar to you, the headphones and microphones and all that. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, you know, radio and TV and writing for radio and writing for news, for TV. And I never did any actual broadcasting after college but it was uh it was a good education yeah it was a lot of fun and i had a great time yeah you know my first two years of college i i wasn't into it you know i i had pretty bad grades because i didn't do a whole lot of the work that was another thing driving me to go into the army i had to figure out do i want to stay here or or what but then after I came out of the service I was motivated you know I was a straight-A student and, mm. and graduated at the top of my class University of Florida? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, then what? Um, I I was in Orlando for a couple of years, and then I moved to New York. Uh, I lived in New York for like 12 years. I lived in Orlando for like three or four, 
And I was actually, when I was in New York, I was on a quiz show. The, <laughs> uh, the $20,000 Pyramid, it was called. Yeah. yeah. With Dick Clark? Or? It was with Dick Clark. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. That's, yep. Yeah. So you were a contestant on there. I was. Yeah. yeah. And I was, I, I won. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I didn't do anything wrong. And if you didn't do anything wrong, it, you were like on the show for 15 minutes and you won $10,000 and that was it. Uh-huh. Wow. You know, and after that, I took that money and my mother was living in Israel. So I went to Israel to visit her. Uh-huh. Uh, and I've been to Israel because I have a sister that lives there who's lived there now for 30 years. I was married to an Israeli. And so I, I've been there for four or five times. Oh, okay. Yeah. But not in the last 15 years. Uh-huh. Thinking about going back maybe next year. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, that's, that's some interesting turn of events. Orlando to New York and on the show with Dick Clark and winning, hit, hitting the jackpot. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, I was... Starting, it was just exploring, I guess, lots and lots of relationships during this period of time. Yeah. And <clears throat> still working and finding myself during this time. Mm-hmm. Um, it was an intense period of time. This is when I actually started exercising. Okay. Yeah, I played lots of racquetball. Uh-huh. I started running. Uh-huh. This is the 70s? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. The yeah. jogging. Yes. Yeah, they yeah. called it jogging back then. <laughs> yes, they did. I would go jogging. Uh-huh. Um, and I supported myself mainly by waiting on tables. Uh-huh. But I also started writing. I started writing fiction. And I, I wrote a novel, and I sent it to, a, to an agent. Okay. And she liked it. And so she started sending it to publishers, and as that process was going on, that's when I moved up to New York to be closer to that scene. Okay. And I found waiter's job up in, in New York, and I was living half the week in New York City and half the week in Long Island. Um, the novel itself made it pretty far. It got up to, like, the third or second desk from the last desk it had to pass to, uh-huh. to get published, and then they turned it down. So nothing ever came of that. Uh. But I wrote a couple of things after that. Again, nothing that got published, but that got me into journalism. Okay. I queried the San Francisco Chronicle with an idea for a syndicated newspaper column about nuclear issues, and back then that was a big deal. Not only nuclear power, but, you know, the, the Soviets and the U.S. building and building their nuclear arsenals. And the, they took it, the San Francisco Chronicle. And so I had this nationally syndicated newspaper column, you know, with lots of well-known people who were calling me, wanting to get in my column. Wait, um, okay, hold on. Let me, let, me, let me catch up in my mind here. So... <laughs> Because there's a lot going on, and I'm 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 following it in my imagination, but um, there's there's a lot of highlights here. So you write the great American novel, and that really gets the creative writing juices flowing, perhaps. And uh, uh, it doesn't actually get published, but then it connects you with the writing community and your journalistic side, and probably beats waiting tables. And yeah, I still waited on tables because it takes a while for the sure. syndicated column to get into, you know, enough newspapers to. Yeah, well, you, I mean, that's that's pretty specialized having a syndicated column. That's different than just having a column in a local paper. They have to be syndicated. Yeah, almost. and it was in the U.S. and Canada. Wow, and you wrote. And I did this for like three and a half, four years. In in the. The, your topic was... Nuclear issues. Nuclear issues. Okay. It was called the nuclear age. A nuclear age. The nuclear, the nuclear age. age. Yeah. In the 
This is in the, the 80s. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cold War still coming to a head. You know, this is a big deal after the SALT treaties and Cold Star War Wars. And nuclear power, you know, there yeah. was Chernobyl. And, yes. Um, yeah. So, anyway. Yeah, well, that's when I was growing up, and it was still very scary. I remember when Reagan had his little joke about the Russians will begin bombing in five minutes and I mean that's a that was a joke but you know this was there was still the nuclear escalation so it was still a, a big deal and of course it still is I don't know if you read Eric Schlosser's book I think his name's Eric Schlosser uh, Command and Control about I haven't uh, yeah it's it's a great book it talks about the um how we came to the brink of nuclear disaster so many times. Nuclear bombs were dropped from planes in South oh, Carolina yeah. and, and plane crashes in North Carolina that almost wiped out the whole state. You know, this was... Anyhow, it's a, it's a great book, and um, I'm kind of interested in, in the, the nuclear history and just the fact that we're still here, which seems like a miracle. <laughs> Okay, so this was your specialty, and you did this for, for three years, you said. Yeah, yeah. three years and change. Uh huh. And then this was sort of a transition period where people were starting to lose interest, you know, in nuclear issues. The, uh, yeah. the Cold War didn't seem so scary. I don't remember yeah. if this is when, you know, I don't remember when Russia you know, broke apart. But people were just, you know, it, it stopped having such a great interest. Wait, so, I mean, it's, just, <laughs> it's interesting to me how we just kind of forgot about nuclear weapons as a culture, and it just kind of dissipated as an issue. It you did. Know? It's kind of like... It's so true. And it's like it we, was... Yeah, we were going to the moon, and then we got bored with that. <laughs> we just stopped going to the moon and still haven't been back. And nuclear weapons were such a big issue, and then we, it just kind of dissipated. And it's, it's, it's just very interesting how consciousness can just let go of these issues which grip us with fear or with interest. You know, strange the shifts that it takes. Yeah, well, anyhow, sorry to interrupt. But, no, no. Um, okay, so... Now I was married. So you got married? Mm hmm Yeah, okay. Yeah, um, in 1984, uh -huh. Susan and I got married. Okay, wow. All and right. we'd known each other then for three years, three and a half years. Uh -huh. She had two kids. <clears throat> and um, then she and I had a kid, too. And I decided to move back to Florida to work with my dad, with his construction company, and I started working for him, and that lasted about three months. And so anyway, after about three months, I stopped working with him, but I, then I got a job as an editor. There was a, a really good magazine house down in Winter Park, which is a suburb of Orlando. Yeah, I've been here. Uh, women's Sports and, it, and Fitness magazine, Water Ski magazine, Windsurfing magazine, and... I was an editor on all three magazines, and I did that for a number of years. Okay, so you still got the, the fitness thing going on? Still, Yes, yeah, and I was still playing a lot of racquetball. I uh -huh. was starting to run really seriously. In fact, I was, now I'm, right, I'm running marathons. Okay. Yeah, I've heard you mention this before in yoga class that you, you used to run marathons, so I figured... We were getting to this point at some point along the way. So. And I was taking it really seriously. Yeah. You know, I was running a marathon at a six and a half minute pace. Whoa. You know, two, two hours and 50 minutes. Yes. Or is that, is, it, is that right? Or is it three hours? No, two hours and 50 minutes. Yes, yeah, so that's like qualifying for the Boston Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I qualified easily yeah. for Boston. Yeah. I didn't run Boston, but I could have if I wanted to. Uh-huh. Very fast. So I was, I was definitely getting into exercise a lot, and yeah. I was, I was really into running. Yeah, because mile after mile. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh huh. There's a peace in running long distance. Yeah. Okay. You 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 just settle into this pace, and and nothing's going to disturb you, and you just you're just there, and your body's like doing it. 
And may, maybe it's not like this for everyone, but you get into this, I would get into this real quiet place. Yeah. And I liked that. Yeah. You know? Not a lot of thinking going on. My first marathon I didn't plan very well for. I just decided like six weeks before, I'll, I'll try to run a marathon. And I didn't even train very hard, but I ran a really fast first 12 miles. But by mile 15, if you would have looked at me, you would have said, he's running, but people were walking by me. They were walking faster. <laughs> I was running, but... but <laughs> I was one of those pathetic people. Uh, well, it, yeah, if you don't, it, it's your first one. You don't know how it goes. And at the but end you were still race, going hard, huh? <laughs> at the end of the race, my car was in this parking lot that you had to you had to walk, let's say, fifty feet to, and there was a rise of maybe six inches uh -huh. um, from where you started to where the parking lot was in this fifty feet, and I had to crawl. I could not walk it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, okay, so, but you stuck with it, huh? And that was a thing for a while. I stuck with it for a long time. Yeah, okay. Like it, how many... it was what led me into yoga. Okay. Like a bunch of marathons over the years? Yeah, well, not, you know, maybe 10, yeah. 12. Ooh. Yeah. I ran the first Disney marathon, mm -hmm. you know, and then I ran another one a number of years later. I ran the Marine Corps marathon, mm -hmm. a marathon in Long Island. Yeah, I was I was a runner. Yeah. Okay. And you mentioned that running led you into yoga. It did. Because um I'm trying to think. So my my work life, my work career life, I started as a waiter for a number of years. Then I became a journalist, you know, slash editor. And I have edited, I have worked as a professional editor too, if like on a, like books and stuff like that. Oh yeah, and you were talking and about then, the magazine. Yeah, okay. And then I, right, the magazine was a job, but then just like freelance editing for authors. Oh, okay, yeah. But then I went back to college. I went to Rollins um, College in Winter Park, yeah. and I got a degree in elementary education. And okay. then I taught elementary school for seven years. Okay. All right. <clears throat> um, and it was in that period of time when my wife started getting interested in yoga. Okay. And she, she was in this style called Iyengar, uh -huh. which is a kind of a slow alignment-based style of yoga. It's actually a cousin to the style Ashtanga that I teach now. But Ashtanga is much faster than Iyengar. But anyway, she dragged me to a couple of classes, you know, and they were vaguely interesting. I just enjoyed, like, doing something with Susan, and then we, after class we would go to lunch somewhere together, and it was just, like, a good experience yeah. to be together doing this. But then she wanted to go to this workshop and it was in North Carolina so Susan said she wanted to go because these things these things were like a week long yeah and I said sure I'll go I'm not going to take any yoga class but North Carolina has great hills and it's really going to be good for my running yeah so okay. I'll be running there and maybe I'll take a class or two and the first day I took the first class in the morning and I just fell in love with it mm. um, and I took every single class I still ran but I took every single class um, and here I had been running now for I don't know how many years but after this workshop we stopped in Asheville on the way home we went to Malaprops and mm. I just willy-nilly picked a yoga book it happened to be a Bikram yoga book yeah <laughs> and when we went home I started practicing yoga and I started really cutting back on my running and eventually, mm -hmm. I stopped running and just did yoga. I mean, year, you know, a few years later, I started 
weaving some running back in. Hmm. But I just, I loved it so much, and I, I, I loved how it made me feel. And uh, I, I, I just made the switch. My wife couldn't believe it because <laughs> she just figured she was married to a runner for the rest of her life. Uh-huh. Okay. So the, the transition from running, what brought me to the yoga was the hills of North Carolina that I came for for my running and then ended up falling in love with yoga. So yoga. So it's kind of funny, my transition from running to yoga in that I, I didn't want to lose my cardiovascular you know, fitness. Yeah. So what I did for a couple of months actually was for 40 minutes, I would do sun salutations, but really fast. And when I ran, I ran with a heart rate monitor so hmm. when I did the sun salutations, I did the same thing. And so for 40 minutes, I would do sun salutations so fast that my heart rate monitor, it was as if I was running six-minute miles. <laughs> it was. And I, would, and I would hold it for like 40 minutes, you know? Wow. And what was funny was, you know, Susan was taking from this teacher in Orlando, and he had a studio, and because I'd be doing these really fast sun salutations, every month I would wear out a mat. It would just like, it would be in shreds by the end of the month. And so every month she, she'd buy another mat from this teacher, and he taught Iyengar, this really slow style, and he right. just said, what is your husband doing? You know? <laughs> <laughs> to, yeah, to, well, what were you doing? Uh, just maintaining your fitness and... Yeah, but then I, you know, I read that Bikram book and I started practicing Bikram, but there wasn't any Bikram studios in Orlando at the time. Okay. <clears throat> so I practiced it at home and I didn't need 100 degrees like they do in Bikram. I just doing those poses, I sweat like crazy anyway. And part of yeah. it was I was in Florida, yeah. but part of it was just it was it was felt really strenuous. Yeah. That'd and I sweat like crazy. Yeah. Um, and I experimented with lots of different styles of yoga. Um, mm. And then I found Ashtanga. And I found it by reading about it in Yoga Journal magazine. And I got a book and I got a video. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And it just spoke to me, you know? Yeah. It, it, uh, and I was really interested in the beginning just in the physical side. So, so into the 90s a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. What um, video was it? Was it Patabi Joyce? No, it was David Swenson. Okay. Right. Uh, and it was Richard Freeman. Yeah. Actually, I think, yeah, it was both. I got both of their videos. Yeah, I've <clears> seen and, the Richard Freeman one. Yeah. And his video came with a little booklet that was really helpful. But then I guess he said a couple of things in the booklet that he didn't like. And they hmm. stopped putting them in his videos after that. So I got one of these rare Richard Freeman booklets about Ashtanga that I found really helpful. But anyway, <laughs> um, then that was my passion. Then I found Ashtanga. And I was in Orlando, and, and right at this time, Madonna was coming out in a movie where she played a yoga teacher. Okay. Um, I don't remember the name of the movie. Yeah, I don't either. <clears throat> but it was Ashtanga yoga that she did. And it was Ashtanga yoga that she portrayed in the movie. And I pitched the Orlando Sentinel a, a, a story about Madonna's doing this movie. I teach this yoga. And they did an article. <clears throat> and um, my phone ran off, out, off the hook. And so <laughs> I, I, had to, I had to have these work workshops. I had a day where I, it was like an introduction to Ashtanga. And I like had four of these. They were maybe an hour, hour and a half. And suddenly I had this huge student base. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of where it started. I, 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 I left the studio where I was teaching because the man who owned the studio started getting into another style of yoga and he didn't want Ashtanga. So I rented space and um, had students, you know, students would come to this space, and then 
I was still teaching elementary school, but now I'm teaching a lot of yoga, and it was like too much to do both, and I had to choose one. And Susan and I had this pipe dream of opening a yoga studio, so I decided to go that way. And it was a tough decision, because I love teaching the kids, you know, but I yeah. love teaching yoga too. Hmm. So we decided to go the direction of yoga. And at a local gym, we, for the first year, our studio was just at this gym that we kind of rented space, that we rented space from, that people came as we were looking for a place of our own to rent. And then we finally found it, and that was became our studio, Full Circle Yoga. And that's, it's still going on. We sold it, and... Um, it's still really popular. Well, let's, let's take a step back. Let's go back to Ashtanga for our, our listeners. Because, well... You know, I've been coming to your classes for three years, and that's how I found you for the podcast, uh, because discovering Ashtanga through your classes really has just opened all kinds of doors for me. Um, so I'd like to, let's, let's introduce it to our listeners, kind of what the, what the practice is. And Ashtanga is a series of poses. Uh, so every if you come to an Ashtanga class, you'll do the same poses in the same order every time. And it's a beautifully put together series of poses. It's very intelligently put together. When you come to a pose, your body's been prepared for it. And afterward, there'll be a counter pose so that you end up really balanced. Um, to go through the full first series and there's four series but to go through the full first series takes an hour and a half you know there are shorter versions you can do but to do the full series it's an hour and a half yeah and you start with sun salutations and it's the same poses that you'll do in lots of other styles of yoga but you hold each pose for a certain number of breaths <clears throat> and you just you go in the particular order. And it's a wonderful physical practice. Yeah. It's flexibility, it's strength, it's stamina. And if I could only do one exercise, like just for the physical benefits, that would, ha and it's also good cardiovascular. Um, that yeah. would be the one I do. And I truly, with the cardiovascular, I was talking about this before, before I started running, you know, my wake-up heartbeat would be like in the 70s or the high 60s when I woke up in the morning. And yeah. then I started running and it got into the 50s and I started running more seriously and it got into the 40s. Wow. And maybe two weeks before a marathon, it would be 35, 36, <laughs> my wake-up. So then I stopped running and I was just doing yoga. I was just doing, when I was doing Ashtanga yoga and... <clears throat> I know that if I had stopped doing all exercise altogether, it would have gone right back up where it started in the 60s and or low 70s. Yeah. But with the Ashtanga yoga, it was like in the, the low to mid 40s, and yeah. it stayed there. So, so there's some cardiovascular benefit that comes from doing this practice regularly. It can't be getting your heart into that zone, you know, that aerobic, yeah. window that it's supposed to get into because it doesn't get in it doesn't get that high but hmm. there's something going on cardiovascular that that has a good cardiovascular so you know just on the physical front it's a, a fabulous practice um and it's it's not easy the poses aren't easy right it moves fast probably faster than any and than any yoga normal regular yoga class yeah. Um, but it's not as fast as, say, an aerobics class, but it does move, because it, it's yoga, but it does move relatively fast. Right. So you have the physical side, 
But then there's also this, the, the inner side that, that works toward, toward getting you more peaceful inside. And lot, some of it is how you breathe in Ashtanga, which has a real peaceful effect on your body. It's getting your mind quiet, where, so it takes you away from the world for while you're doing the yoga. Yeah. And your body takes you through the practice because it knows what comes next, and you're just in this quiet place inside, really undistracted. And it's even though you're, you're working your tail off, eventually is very peaceful. Yeah. And it it teaches you things. It teaches you patience. It teaches you humility. Mm. Um, it teaches you determination. Mm. And it teaches things that you never expect, like from that seem to come out from left field where you start like eating better, you know? Yeah. And and you start taking in more of the world as you're looking around and and just good things seem to happen and yeah. it's a, it's a, part of it's mysterious to me yeah um a part of it makes perfectly good sense you know mhm ashtanga means eight limbs right yes okay ashtanga means eight and it refers to the eight limbs okay and because yoga the yoga that's most styles follow was first prescribed by a man named Patanjali. Yeah. <clears throat> and he broke it down into the eight limbs. The first two, and, and only one of them is yoga poses. You know, your first two are a code of ethics, basically. Right. You, know? you have these five yamas and five niyamas, they're called. How to live your life. The third one so they're they're considered like more basic that you need to know these first before you actually start doing your poses, you know. Mm. But the head of of Ashtanga Yoga, who's no longer with us, but a man named Patabi Joyce, he said through doing your Ashtanga Yoga, you're gonna you're gonna learn these first two anyway. They're gonna mm. teach you these things, and I think maybe he's right, but. <clears throat> then you have your third limb as your poses. Okay. But after that, you know, you've got pranayama, which is yogic breathing, mm -hmm. which is really powerful stuff that can really help you get more peaceful as well. And a lot of Ashtanga is a style of yoga that incorporates breathing. Um, it's so woven into the practice more than any other style of yoga that I've ever seen, actually. Mm. Um, except maybe Kundalini, which really focuses on the breath. But here mm. in Ashtanga, and Kundalini in Ashtanga, the Ashtangis like to do Kundalini, and Kundalini people like to do Ashtanga, because there is that connection. Yeah. But um, in Ashtanga... You know everything. The breathing. If you're not, you're not doing Ashtanga. If you're not doing the breathing, right? Um, but anyway, after the poses, the the fourth limb is the pranayama. It's the breathing, and then from there, it, it's like concentration, meditation, and and it goes up to this bliss, what they call samadhi. Right. And the breath is so important because it's what connects your body to your mind. So you really have to have a good focus on that. Otherwise, you're just doing something physical or you're just doing something mental, but they're not tied together. The breath is really critical. Yeah. So you start, you start learning how important the breath is and how to kind of control your breath and work with your breath <clears throat> in your Ashtanga yoga. You know, then you have, if you want to, and Patavi Joyce would teach people first series, second series, and then he would start teaching specific pranayama. Wow. So, and that takes a while to get through those. It, well, you, you start right from the beginning. It's oh, always okay. things you can do, but then you get, you fine tune and you get better at it. You know, yeah. there's places where you breathe a certain way or you hold your breath for a certain length of time and, and you get bitter at these things and you start being able to control and you know it's like pranayama gets into these 
seemingly crazy things where if you're doing something creative, you'll think more creatively, people who are pranayama experts say, if you're breathing through your left nostril rather than your right nostril. Right, right. Whereas, whereas things like logic and math, then you want to be breathing, you know, or figuring out a schedule, then you want to be breathing through your right nostril. You know, and right. then you're working toward balancing, and, and, and it's all for the effort of getting you closer and closer to, it, to inner peace and, and inner happiness. Yeah. So Ashtanga, Patabi Joyce believed that Ashtanga was the yoga that Patanjali was talking about, because it's so woven into the eight limbs. It, it's just, it sinks in with it. S Y N C. It sinks in with those eight limbs. Yeah. Um, so practically, perfectly. Yeah. Yeah. I was reading the, uh, the about Ashtanga on the the Mysore page, the Sharat Joyce's yeah, Patabi Joyce Center in Mysore, and he was talking about how uh, following the discipline of Ashtanga. I'm not sure if he used the word tones, but basically tones the body and trains the body. And uh, if you follow it and stick with it and, and remain disciplined with it, eventually the mind quiets itself automatically, was the word that he used, automatically. Which There is this button in your head hmm. that you can only find by self-discovery. And the yoga prepares you, I guess. You want to, if your body is, is doesn't feel good, if, if you can't sit for long without getting uncomfortable, then you can't start doing things like meditation and quieting your mind. But Ashtanga, you know, you don't, you can eventually do meditation in your practice. You know, you're just right. breathing, listening to your breath, your eyes are not distracted. So, I mean, my teacher, David Swenson, he doesn't meditate per se regularly where he'll sit somewhere with cross legs and, and meditate. He does it in his practice. You know, I, I, do, I do it in my practice as best as I can, but I, I also mm -hmm. do it a little, you know, on its own. Um, people can give you maybe exercises to do, but you're the only one who can actually figure it out by doing these kind of exercises that get you to quiet your mind down. Like a very simple one would be just sort of breathing and listening to your breath and seeing how long you can go without having a thought come in and interfere. You know, yeah. and then if a thought comes in, then you acknowledge it and go right back to listening to your breath. And if you do this... Um, the more you do it, the better you get at it until you figure out, oh, I know how I can get my mind quiet. I, I know that feeling. And you can recreate it. It's, that's this thing I'm calling your button in your head. So it, if you're in a tense situation, you can stay calm and cool. If you need to really concentrate or focus on something, um, <clears throat> You can. You push that button, and you're right there. You're totally present. You're right in the middle of it. Um, and so Ashtanga is a, a kind of a good way to start working toward that skill. That is a, a, a skill that, what I say in my classes, it'll, I say it it'll take more lines off of your face than any preparation you can put on it. Right. Because it, once you, you've found that button your whole life just becomes more, more peaceful. Yeah. Yeah, I've, some of my clients will recognize how I've borrowed uh, one <laughs> of your phrases that if you don't practice it, you'll never get any better at it, but if you do practice it, you'll always get a little bit better. That's and true. I used to teach in Orlando, I used to teach the people at Cirque du Soleil, 
There's a Cirque yeah. du Soleil show called La Nuba at Disney in Orlando. Okay. And I would come on Saturdays and teach them Ashtanga yoga. These are people who who could, you know, do any of these poses without blinking an eye. <clears throat> yeah, literally um, circus performers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but what they liked about it, um, what they really liked about it wasn't doing the poses. They liked the breathing and they mm. liked the, the focus part because this is something they weren't getting. Mm. Um, and so when I would come and practice and we would we would do some some difficult poses, but it wouldn't be super strenuous because they had to perform that night and didn't yeah. want to, you know, get worn out. Um, <clears throat> but they they loved it because it it brought them to this quiet place and and they liked you know coming into their performance from this quiet place. It, it they liked kind of doing the physical part, which warmed them up. But it was it was it was the breathing and the getting the mind quiet that they kept asking for. Yeah. So you know that that aspect. You know, a lot of people. What draws people just like me to Ashtanga is the physical. Yeah. That's, that's how I started. You know, and then all of a sudden it's kind of almost insidious how you start. It starts working on you, and you start getting more interested in these other aspects and and becoming uh, you start feeling better and you start becoming a better person maybe even you know i mean it's just pretty amazing yeah it really is wow <laughs> <laughs> um this is so great getting the opportunity to talk to you because i've been coming to your classes three years and i I, you know, I really don't, didn't know much at all about you. And so this is quite a humbling experience and also <laughs> such, a, uh, such a great joy to be able to sit down and talk with you and hear some of your experiences with it. So you said that you, you opened your own studio and, and you ran your own studio for 10 years. And were you teaching primarily Ashtanga during that time mm. or different disciplines as well? No, I was teaching Ashtanga. We had other mm -hmm. teachers that taught other styles, and my wife was teaching prenatal yoga, uh -huh. uh, and she was really good at it, too. Mm. Um, and it was, I mean, we met such good people, and it was, and we had such good teachers working for us, um, but we didn't really delegate enough. We sort of wanted to make, we, we just kept our eyes on everything that was going on, and eight or nine years into it, we were getting really burned out. And it seemed like whenever we went, we went on vacation, something awful would happen in the studio. <laughs> you know, the the toilets would overflow, or uh, you know. Yeah. But um, we were starting to get really burned out, so yeah. we started thinking about selling it. But I have just really wonderful memories of that. Mm -hmm. You know. Did you meet some other uh, some of these? Uh, great yogis who do workshops you said that david williams is a buddy of yours and oh yeah and then david swenson he came maybe five times we, oh wow we they wanted to come <clears throat> because we we would have lots of people come to these things uh -huh. we were one of the only studios that brought in really well-known teachers and we brought in quite a few of them hmm. like david williams you know, would tell other teachers, like, you ought to go to Lewis's studio. It's like, man, so many people, you know, they made good money coming to our studio. So we got yeah. lots of good teachers to come. Yeah. But, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so, yeah, yeah, we met lots of, and, and they, the teachers also liked coming because we would, like, take them out to dinner. We would, it's, yeah. it'd be, it wouldn't just be like a business kind of thing. You know? Yeah. Did you ever, uh, have you ever been to Mysore? I have not. Okay. <clears throat> um, and I, it, I'd be interested to go, but I don't feel driven, like I've really right. missed something, because I know what exactly, I know so many people that went. 
right. that I know what it's like. Um, <clears throat> and, and Mysore, you know, there's two ways to learn Ashtanga. You can learn it through a Mysore style. Most yoga classes that people know about are lead classes, like my classes, where the right. teacher like talks you through the whole class. Mm -hmm. The Mysore approach is where the student will come in and he might have a cheat sheet which has all the poses, pictures of all the poses in order, um, or he knows all the poses in order, and he goes through the whole practice, or she, um, themselves, <clears throat> and so when you look in a Mysore class, people will be on will all be on different poses, and the teacher walks around and helps people individually as they're doing their own practice. You don't start out doing the whole practice. You start out, the teacher will give you just a few poses, and in each successive time that you come, you learn more, and you learn more. And I think both ways, lead class or Mysore class, are excellent ways to learn. <clears throat> and um, there are advantages and disadvantages to both. So, um, but I, I think they're both terrific ways to learn. And there is a Mysore place now in Asheville as well. Right. Yeah. Right. And on your website, uh, which is Ashtanga Asheville. Ashtanga Asheville dot com. Right. And you have a listing of all the, the Ashtanga classes in town. Mm-hmm. Okay. As well as a, a guide to Ashtanga. And, and yes. Yeah. And uh, because you'll find Ashtanga at the studio where I teach, Asheville Yoga Center. You'll find it at the Community Yoga Center um, yeah. in, in Woodfin. There's this Mysore place as well. Um, so I've got... And I update it regularly, all the current classes that are being taught mm -hmm. in town. Mm -hmm. And for those uh, listeners who haven't been to one of your classes, you teach the primary series the same way each time. Or very, I mean, you follow the series, but you teach uh, with a lot of the same cues and a lot of the same dedication to, uh, there's a lot of repetition uh, between classes. Yeah, and the thing is, if you're always, if you're working on the same poses each class, then you can really gauge your progress. Right. <clears throat> um, people, you know, there are a lot of people who like variety, and they think that doing the same, doing a uh, prescribed order of poses every single time would be boring, and for some people it probably is. But... For many people, the, the practice just gets you so present that it's like brand new each time you do it. And um, I find that from the teaching. I, I've never, I've never, I mean, in my practice, say yes, each time it, it, it never gets boring. But when I teach a class, I'll, I'll never, it's it, like in Bikram classes, they have to use this script and they say the same things each time. I often say lots of things the same, but but it never feels the same to me. It's always fresh, and and it's, so it'll right. always come out a little bit different. You yeah, know? I, that's when I stop teaching. Is when it starts feeling stale. Yeah, you know that's yeah. that that'll be my sign that okay, it's that. But but that's that just hasn't happened, and I've been teaching now for more than twenty years. Yeah, that's <laughs> just uh, I'm just joyful thinking of of this practice that's been introduced to me and it really is such a treat to be talking to you uh, in this format because I've just benefited so much from your teachings and it has not become the least bit stale. It is very interesting each time. I, I learn something every single class oh, for sure. Well, that's good to hear. I, I wanted to uh, ask you about uh, this aspect that, that Brooke thinks that Ashtanga Yoga is it's very good for beginners despite it being uh, fast-paced and you know, physically strenuous, and you've spoken to this more, I guess I'm just trying to, to ask you to elaborate about this, uh, about how uh, in the process of the practice, it kind of trains you into developing and growing into the practice. It's not like something you've mastered right when you start it. You don't have to 
start it that way. I mean, that's not how it goes. And yeah. you know, people who've never done yoga <clears throat> might be kind of, this might be kind of a little a shock coming to an Ashtanga class. And there are some, there are some Ashtanga teachers that are sort of intimidating. And I, I've heard from lots of students who have said, oh, I took an Ashtanga class and, and I was so intimidated, I hadn't taken one since. You know, they, but they, I said, I'll, they said, I'll, well, we'll just try it here and see what happens. And then they, like, love the practice. Because, yeah. you know, if, if someone is, hasn't done yoga, either start with some really gentle style where you're going to just start getting comfortable with it. Um, or you can come to a, a class like Ashtanga class. Just make sure that the teacher knows that you're new to it. And I tell all my new students, your job is not to be good at this. Um, right. Your job is just do what you can. If you get tired, rest. Stretch medium. Don't stretch hard. Um, and it, just do what you can and see what it's like. And 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 let that let that be your goal, you know, yeah. for this first class. And and so people then don't feel so pressured, and. Um, Oftentimes, really like it, and oftentimes get very sore the next day. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, when I first got started with it, you know, I'd seen uh, a couple videos. Uh, I'd seen the video where Patabi Joyce is in New York City, and uh, saw these people flipping and flying around. And it. I studied with him in New York City. Actually. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh wow! What a treat. Yeah. But anyway. Yeah. You saw this video. Yeah, I saw the video and it was pretty intimidating, but I went to your class and the way you teach was conducive to a beginner and uh, you know, I was not doing the poses to their full expression as as you say, but uh and I'm still not, but it was very welcoming and inviting to somebody who was totally new to yoga like me and uh, I really appreciated that, and well, I've really benefited from that. One yeah. thing my teacher taught that was new in Ashtanga, you know, in Mysore, India, if you go and study there, once you come to a pose and you can't do the final pose, they stop you, and they won't let you go farther until you master that pose. Yeah. So what my teacher, David Swenson, started teaching was giving modifications so that a student could do every single pose, maybe not the final pose, but a pose that'll get you working toward doing it. And that makes just such good sense to me. Yeah. Um, because there are poses, you know, they stop, if you get stopped at this point in the practice, there's still going to be poses ahead that you could have done, but they're not letting you do. And this way, you get a sense for what the full primary series is like, and you get you get a lot more out of it, and you will learn either way, the Mysore way or a lead class that has modifications, you'll learn probably at the same, it'll take you the same amount of time to learn the same amount, either way, you know? Mm -hmm. So... Um, but I'm grateful to David Swenson for just starting to introduce modifications. If you get his book, you know, he's got the final pose is pictured on the left page, and on the right page, he's got a number of alternatives for those who haven't worked up to the final pose yet. So you can go through the whole practice. And it's fun if there are poses that, that you can't do, because then over time you start progressing and, and you yeah. get better at them. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And you can feel the progress. Yeah. So, you mentioned that you'd written a novel and you talked about writing a column on the nuclear age. 
you talked about running marathons, and you talked about yoga, of course, and as we were preparing for this podcast, uh, I saw the article in the Citizen Times about how you had done the New York Times crossword for last week, just a week ago. Tell us about that. Well, um, probably... Um, and when I say done, I mean designed the crossword for the New York Times last I, week. Yeah. When did you get into crosswords? How do you find time for all this? Uh, probably 2007 or 2008, I saw this movie called Wordplay. Oh, yeah. Um, right. It was a documentary, and it was based around the New York Times crossword puzzle, which is the, kind of the cream of the crop. And it intrigued me, and I just started doing the New York Times crossword puzzle. And, and these, the puzzles get harder as the week goes along. Yeah. So Monday's really easy. Tuesday's fairly easy. Wednesday starts getting tough. Thursday is usually tricky. Um, Friday is very hard, and Saturday is opaque. And yeah. when I started doing the crossword puzzles, Friday and Saturday, I thought nobody really actually did these, you know, that they were just there and people could <laughs> claim they did them, but no one actually did. And, but over time, you, get, you just get better at it. You mm -hmm. know, it's like yoga. And... Mm -hmm. I, so now I'll, I'll do the Friday and Saturday puzzles, and, uh, and I'll actually do them, you know? Um, so about three years ago, I thought, well, maybe, what would it be like to try to construct a crossword puzzle? And I started experimenting with it, and it was, and it still is, extremely difficult, you know, to get to get the words to mesh and and not use like really obscure words to make that happen and yeah. to, to come up with clues that give enough away but not so much away that there's no challenge to it. And I just, I kept at it. It sort of became a habit and then it became a silly hobby and I started making them and I started submitting them. them. And my, really, I just wanted to, to get in the New York Times. I didn't want to start low, I just wanted to get there. So my first nine submissions were rejected, mm. and then this puzzle was the tenth, and he didn't accept it right away. All I got back was, well, Will Shorts is the editor, and, right. and, and he said, well, um, there's, you know, these ugly words here and those over there. If you want to work on trying to clean this up some, uh, I'm willing to look at the puzzle again. <clears throat> and so I, I did, and I worked, and I worked, and I sent it back to him. But m most of the puzzles in the New York Times have themes. And yeah. to get it to work, I had to change one theme answer uh, uh, to an inferior answer, which I didn't like. And, so, and anyway, I sent that to him, and then he came back and said, well, yes, you fixed these things, but I, I liked that original theme answer. I, I liked it much better than what you've got there. See if you can get that, and I'll, I'll be willing to look at it again. And then then finally, and this is this is a process that's like molasses. It takes a long time to hear back. But then I got... An email and all it, it you know it was from will shorts and and the subject was yes exclamation point and was saying that he has accepted the puzzle so that was like that was that was a big thing yeah and i'm still making them and i'm still submitting them and hopefully there'll be more <laughs> wow it's, what a story i mean <laughs> this is this there's a theme here, the theme of perseverance, it sounds like. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. That's it interesting. through all these. Yeah. Uh, that, you're that, into that. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. Like running marathons? Uh, yeah. Running marathons and this vigorous Ashtanga practice and the New York Times crossword. Yeah. That's, uh, that's interesting. Yeah. Does it feel that way for you? Does it, do you feel like it requires a lot of perseverance? Does it? Do you do you like the challenge of 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 these disciplines? I do, and maybe I'm a little obsessive. <laughs> 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 you know, I got things I like and I like to do, and yeah. I just stick with them. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, I I can drop them, 
I've dropped like I dropped my running. Yeah. <clears throat> but uh, I guess I do like to stick with things. Well, I like to stick with things too if I'm making progress. And when I hear about these disciplines that you're in, you know, like running, you can follow a time and you can track your pace and you can have a goal and work towards it. And it sounds like it took, uh, you know, it was a work in progress, the New York Times crossword. And with yoga, it's always a work in progress. And it, 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 it's been such a revelation to me that, you know, there's always something there. There's always room for growth. And it's something that will serve you. And, and these are all kind of healing activities yeah. or healthy activities, right, actually. Right. The yeah. running, the yoga, the, the crossword keeps your mind active. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So so if I'm if I'm obsessive, at least it's over sort of healthy things. Yeah. Well that's that's really great and that's really interesting and it's inspiring too, you know. It's a good mm -hmm. way to find avenues to dedicate ourselves to that pay dividends. Does your wife do the crossword with you? She does the local crossword, uh -huh. but I started handing her the Monday puzzle actually like two months ago or a month and a half ago, and she's done them all. And, and just last week she said, why don't you give me the Tuesday puzzle also? Yeah. Uh -huh. So the last, this week it was actually a hard Tuesday puzzle. For, it was hard for Tuesday. Yeah. Um, but she got almost all of it, yeah. and she's intrigued to continue. So, so for a while, it'll be Monday and Tuesday, and yeah. we'll see where it goes from there. Sure. And she enjoys your, your perseverance with these things, I'm sure, watching you go. I guess. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she at least puts up with it, right? Yeah. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Well, Lewis, it sounds like we covered a lot here. I, I really thank you for... Uh, for taking the time to come out and share uh, some of your life experience and your experience with yoga and, and all of this. It's a very interesting story, and I appreciate you sharing it with me and, and with our audience. Well, I hope people find it sort of to be helpful somehow, you know, in, in obvious and maybe less obvious ways. Exactly, yeah. Well, thank you very much. How do you feel? I feel great. I, I appreciate you inviting me, and I've actually enjoyed our conversation. Great. All right, so listen. Thank you very much. Well, that was my conversation with Lewis Rothline, my personal yoga teacher. And man, what a story. I had no idea. <laughs> uh, it's always a treat interviewing these guests. Thanks for tuning in to the podcast. And thanks to Lewis for sharing what he did with us. I hope you enjoyed it. I really enjoyed talking to him and getting a chance to get to know him a little bit. Well, the podcast is called Anecdotal Evidence. And there, Lewis shared part of his anecdote. If you've got any ideas for the podcast, send me an email. Anecdotal evidence at danieljohnsonmd.com. And as always, thanks for tuning in. This is Daniel Johnson, MD. I'll see you next time. Take care.